Hi, everybody. This is Mark Cook with Kit Planes Magazine. Welcome to our little check-in with Vans Aircraft. I've got Greg Hughes here with the, the uh, marketing maven, I like to call him. I know that's not his official title, but he's so good at it. Uh, and Chief Engineer Ryan Johnson, thank you for joining me, guys. Uh, we've got a few things to talk about in today's little check-in, but I wanted to start off with, uh, with, with sort of this question for you. What I have seen in the industry generally, and this comes from uh, other airframe manufacturers, from avionics people, from engines people, uh, mm -hmm. from uh, suppliers like Aircraft Spruce, is that generally speaking, uh, our industry is doing really, really well. Seems like a lot of people are, are starting up new projects. Uh, they're resuscitating older projects that maybe had started and kind of were left to go follow. Uh, yep. We have people buying other people's airplanes and working on them. So we have a lot of activity. Uh, what has this meant for vans and what, what has this sort of meant for, uh, for your uh, workflow? Well, I mean, it's meant a lot. So, you know, a year ago or so when, um, you know, the, the pandemic first hit, you know, we sat in, in this room here and had conversations about what's going to happen, you know, and I mean, how can you possibly foresee what's going to happen? But, you know, we had to plan for everything from the worst case scenario to, the absolute worst case scenario, um, you know, and, uh, you know, from a business planning perspective, but what I don't think anybody really foresaw was that what would happen was what did. Um, so apparently, I think to, to, to make it a short conversation, uh, type A personalities that uh, are not the types that sit around and twirl their thumbs, apparently uh, don't sit around and twirl their thumbs, right? So, you know, the number of kits that's been ordered, the parts that have been ordered, when people uh, of this ilk have time to build an airplane, what do they do? They take the opportunity to build the airplane. Um, and there really has been, you know, uh, as a side effect of the whole situation, a, a lot of opportunity for people to do just that. I think a lot of people also who had thought about it for a long period of time suddenly found themselves worth a lot of time to spend on the internet and doing research and things like that and, and to learn new things. Um, about about that interest and an opportunity to learn new things by doing. So that's that's been really, really key. Um, so we were, you know, um, not shocked, but certainly surprised by by the volume of orders, you know, and the number of new people coming into it and getting started. Um, kind of expected an uptick in the um, in the activity that people from people that had already started, right? That was certainly expected. Uh, but we've seen a um, maybe borderline ridiculous number of new project starts and whatnot. And, uh, you know, and, and it's, that's, that curve has only been going up and continuing over time. So, you know, since the beginning of this year, we've had multiple record weeks of kit orders. Um, last week was a new record week, actually, in terms of the number of kit orders um, and large numbers of tail kits, which of course is typically the first kit that somebody orders when they order from it. So, I mean, we've had COVID, right? Um, let's see, we had COVID, we had wildfires, hmm. we had ice storms and no power for, what was it, Ryan, a week and a half week. or something crazy like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and all of the things that go along with that, you know, um, staffing impacts related to COVID. But luckily here, we were able to pretty effectively manage that and had, um, you know, a couple of teams that were out for, you know, 10 days or so at a time. Um, and that has some impact, but, you know, it's the kind that we can kind of recover from. Um, the team that builds the quick build kits was significantly impacted for a, for a pretty long period of time um, by the regulations around COVID um, in the Philippines. But you have kind of this worst case scenario where you have increased demand, but you have reduced capacity. And of right. course, I've seen from, from other manufacturers, we have supply line issues as well. I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. you guys and your ability to put metal through the door. It's, can I get all these parts? So I, I would say on supply line though, you know, uh, we don't follow the lean manufacturing philosophy, and it's one advantage we had when COVID started. We were we typically sit on a, a high dollar amount of inventory, and that was an advantage. Uh, where we have we also buy excess material. We store as much material as we can here, but we also pay for storage at the material houses as well. Uh, so we had the extra supply. I don't think we saw that. Where we saw that was on uh, the items such as, uh, there was a slight bump in for engines, but that really passed early on in COVID. And things like wheels, brakes, those type of items that you get from aircraft spruce as well. But for the actual airplane kits, uh, you know, we have, we have material. It's just making enough parts. Uh, speaking to staffing, we've increased staffing by 30% since COVID began. 
So that's a, a very large increase across the board in all departments. Here in engineering, we've doubled the size of engineering to try to take care of sustaining engineering as well as the RV 15 and 16. And, and I think it's worth saying that, you know, Vans is, is a big, big player in our marketplace, but still a relatively modest sized company overall. I mean, you guys do a lot with relatively few people and have done for years, right? Yeah, yes. The, the staff increase, you know, we're still, you know, just almost at 100 people, you know, we're not a, we're not a large company, you know, or any kind of big behemoth conglomerate. We're a small, small company with, right. with a lot of customers that are all doing a common thing. And Ryan's point is really important. So the supply chain issues that we had were really more around just a few components that maybe we don't have quite as much direct control over. But um, because we do so much internally, you know, we do, we have the, um, the ability to impact uh, decisions and priorities when it comes to almost everything that we deliver uh, at Vans. So it must be a bit of a challenge then, because again, you're you're, you know, you want the the company to be as lean as you can make it. Um, and how do you how do you scale for you know this this new uh, new demand? I mean, it's a uh, I've seen your facility, and I look around and I go, okay, if we suddenly doubled to man, demand tomorrow, how would you manage that? And and that's got to be something that you not only look at in terms of today's market, but you go, okay, is this, is this a bubble? Where, where are we in, you know, two, three, four, five years? And, sure. and it must, sure. it must drive a lot of internal decisions right now. Well, when we started COVID, uh, there was the first week where everything was, you know, in flux, and then we saw everything trend up. But uh, even before that, my saying was proceed with optimism. <laughs> and as you know, we've been trying to vertically integrate here at, at Vans. Uh, we have the new Hydra Press. We brought in CNC machines. So now we're bringing, you know, able to increase accuracy and really change the, the way we design parts for the next airplane. Um, there's other machines besides that, a, a high-end uh, CNC tubing bender. Uh, across the board, a lot of equipment was brought in. So we just continued to proceed with optimism. And I, I think that uh, it's treated us well, that, that approach. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's transition then to, uh, to the, the other question or the other issue that you guys are grappling with. And it kind of <clears throat> in part leverages on the, uh, the idea that you had some issues with the, uh, the, the supplier providing the quick build componentry. Obviously it's a big challenge when you, you have COVID facing uh, and lots of other things, but but for the benefit of those who are not quite in the Vans uh, RV circle, uh, would one of you just sort of give me the the top line overview of what you guys are, are facing right now? Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Why don't you start off and kind of give sure. the, the outline? Yeah. So um, mentioned a few minutes ago that our uh, the contractor that we work with in the Philippines that does the quick build assembly. And just so everybody knows, um, the parts that go into the quick build are all uh, manufactured and uh, here in Oregon, and then they're all packaged up and created in large amounts at one time and shipped over, you know, a large number of airplanes worth of parts over to the Philippines. And then they, they assemble those and ship those back on, you know, sort of string them back to us on a continuous basis. Um, and we, and we do forecasting right uh, ahead of time is how we determine what's going to be built to order we're building to forecast and fulfilling orders with the forecast of parts and great so, yeah, let me interrupt you i want it's fair to say though it's you guys have been doing this for a long time yeah this, this is, is the early 90s yes yeah. Okay. Yeah. and and so the the when covid hit and in the philippines um you know there were some restrictions on how far people could travel to get to work um and who was available and so that severely restricted the 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 staffing availability for quite some time. They were shut down, right? I remember, I think it was almost two months they were completely shut down, right? Uh, and then and then opened up at a very, very uh, fractional percentage of staffing right. after that. And so, you know, there was um, limited staff there, um, but what we, the short version is, is what we started to see. Um, and we, it, we started to see reports of this and started to see the actual evidence of it um, right around the first of this year was that um, the quick build assemblies that were coming back with the fuselages and wings, um, that the primer coverage of them appeared to have some problem. We we're starting to see some evidence of uh, surface corrosion on, on the aluminum sheet uh, where, where the primer had been applied on the interior surfaces. And so uh, Ryan and team launched an investigation at that point, of course, in order to determine 
you know, what was going on and, um, and I'll let Ryan go into that, but you know, what we're doing, what we're doing now is working with customers, um, collecting information and working to forecast delivery of quick builds and providing customers different options um, to try to help best meet their needs um, as they're building. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a, I'll be honest, it's a fairly large effort, right? Um, you know, we have a lot of great people here and a lot of people dedicated working on it. Um, it. It takes a little bit of time to put together, but you know, we're, we're certainly well on our way to, you know, figuring out exactly what gets delivered when and in what order. I feel it's important to to emphasize, though, that it's not like Vans is such a megalithic company that you can just turn the, the rheostat up to, you know, 250% overnight and, and clear this backlog. It's 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 absolutely not that simple. But um, right. I think that probably is, is pretty obvious to most people. So, so Ryan, give me a little more deeper, a little deeper dive on uh, on what you guys have found. Yeah, we've done extensive testing. We have uh, access to some great laboratories here in the area, and we've done some SEM testing. That's where we started. So it's it's like an X-ray machine, and the reflected X-rays tell you the chemical composition of what you're looking at. And it was clear there that the the primer wasn't flowing out. So on the affected uh, components, you'd be able to wipe across with a, a white towel, and it would come off light green color, kind of a dusty color. Uh, we also I went to the University of Oregon and their chemistry department slash materials department has also there. It's an ongoing effort, but uh, at least from the initial results, it does look like the primer was not the correct composition. And we don't know if that's a, you know, a, something from COVID that fell out where the, the company that was supplying the primer uh, to the facility in the Philippines uh, changed the composition because of COVID. Uh, we're, we're trying to narrow that down from a, the chemistry side of it. But uh, in this case, we know that the primer was uh, faulty. And so regardless, you had the, the corrosion problem. So at that point, we said, OK, if we're going to sell product out of vans, uh, for those that want to take that product and remediate it themselves, and we have a procedure that we, we put out there, you can do that. Uh, but otherwise, we're either going to take that product and take key components out of it, make sure that the, the holes meet the rivet specifications that we're all used to. We're, and you know, we've thrown away a lot of uh, parts that are not, uh, you know, that didn't meet our specification. Replace everything with new parts, build those back up and uh, sell them. Or uh, we have to put more into the pipeline to, to the Philippines. We've also brought a second uh, QB supplier, which we were intending to do anyway. Uh, it just conveniently overlapped, uh, but it takes time to spool those up. So to give you an idea, uh, the Philippines, it takes about a month for the parts to get there. Then of course you have to build those up and uh, go through QC and bring them back in here, go through another QC process. And uh, that process, you're at least three to four months turnaround. So we're turning the rheostat, as you said, up now, but we won't see the results of that really until the fall when those first parts start coming in from the Philippines. So, so at this point, there, there are several iterations here, obviously. If I'm, if I'm a builder and I have, you know, let's say hypothetically, I'm building an RV-10 and I've got the wings or I, I, have the, the, I bought the, the quick build fuselage from you, uh, what, what are my, kind of reiterate, what are my options? I can fix it myself. I can ask you for remediation. I can swap it out for something else. Talk, talk me through sort of that decision tree. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. That's yeah, the, that's basically it. Yes. Yeah. The uh, the options basically are um, so we have we have customers who have already received a quick build kit, for example, and so uh, in the event that that they can choose to uh, remediate that kit, the, the insufficient primer themselves. Um, so that consists of of inspecting for if there is any surface corrosion. Of course, removing that, applying primer so that you have good primer. Uh, and then uh, uh, potentially treating that with some kind of other compound like a corrosion X or an ACF 50, um, you know, a sort of industry standard uh, for extra protection, uh, especially between lap joints, for example. And then another option would be um, that they could return it to us and uh, return the affected kit to us and then uh, wait for a quick build kit to be available. And then we would ship it to them. And in that case, we're actually, you know, we're paying to pick it up and we're paying to ship the new kit back. Um, 
the time frames associated with that are variable and it depends on which kit it is and um, and also is primarily determined by when was your original quick load kit order placed right is kind of what determines priority in combination with availability of the product and then the other option that people have is to switch from a quick build kit order uh, or return the quick build kit if they already have it and switch to a standard build kit order so and kind of build it from the ground up uh, and that's an option that a few people have also taken. Um, and again, availability of the standard build kits, you know, based on the volume and how much, how much, how far you can turn up that rheostat, you know, it's all, it's variable, it'll vary per kit. And exactly when it happens is a kit by kit thing, a model by model thing. But, um, but those are pretty much the options that people have. Um, and, and what people are selecting is really highly dependent on, you know, what it is that that works best for them. And so we have a significant, significant number of people that are selecting from that entire menu of options, if you will. Uh, do, does it seem like the, the new buyers, I mean, if I'm, if I'm signing up today for a high volume airplane, like, you know, an RV-14 or an RV-10, yeah. um, I, I, I assume that the, the conversation, the sales conversation is a little bit like, well, you know, we have this issue and it's, you know, we would love to get you that, that in six to eight weeks or 10 weeks or whatever it is. It's yeah. just going to have to be later on while we service the people who are ahead of you in line who are already building. Is that fair? And, and we have, we have, uh, so we publish our kit prices and lead times on our website and the lead times on all of our kits have been extended, quick build yeah. kits and standard build kits. And so that reflects um, and we'll we'll update that anytime that our projections change. And so for quick build kits, about a month ago, we changed, or a little more, we changed all of our lead times for quick build kits to be 12 plus months. So it's going to be more than 12 months. We're not yet actually forecasting exactly how far beyond 12 months that will be. Um, we want to be conservative, yes. Yeah. yeah and, but in the in the in the process of you know we, we need to go through the process and we're still working through the process of determining you know uh what dates we can share with customers that already have kits on order um you know in the event that there are revisions to those dates then we'll be communicating that as early as possible you know we're talking about alkaline aluminum we're not talking like you know this is this is a it is a quality issue but it's not a it's not at this point a safety of flight issue for anybody Correct. Who, have this. I think that's a fair point we need to reinforce. Yes. Okay. And Ryan, can you, can you, uh, I mean, so we've, we've spoken with uh, industry experts. We have experts here, obviously at Vans, like incredibly talented people, way more talented than I am, Ryan and others, for example, but we've also, you know, worked with third parties and, and uh, to validate our findings and our assumptions too, right? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, yeah, we're not seeing the corrosion you know, if we look at some recent service Fultons that were also in the industry, it was exfoliation corrosion on major spar components. We're not seeing that here. This is surface corrosion on skins. Um, there are instances where it's in between the joints, and that's probably the most concerning. Uh, but over time, you know, is the airplane going to, you know, come out of the sky or is it going to give you a warning before it does that? And uh, so, our remediation procedure really talks to how you should approach this. If you're going to self-remediate, I think it covers it very well. And if you follow that procedure, you're going to be in a safe uh, location. Safety is paramount here at Vans, so we don't want to compromise that with uh, it. If we notice a, a unit here, as we call them, a fuselage or a set of wings that has a high amount of corrosion, we immediately uh, run it through the, uh, the skill saw and, uh, you know, set it to the recycle bin. So we're not sending units out of here that have a high amount of corrosion. Yeah, we're not gonna sell a wing or kit or a fuselage kit that has, you know, that has an amount of corrosion that we would not be comfortable with dealing with ourselves, right? I mean, just as individuals, not even just as vans. So, right. you know, that's, I think that's a very important point. So when we ship the, if, if somebody does choose to take a, uh, an affected kit, so that it has the affected primer, you know, then we provide a stipend of $2,000 per quick build kit. So for a set of quick build wings is $2,000 for a quick build fuselage, there's a $2,000 stipend. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that is to help pay for the materials and time costs associated with, you know, doing the remediation. And, you know, people have different uh, priorities around that sort of thing too. Some people don't want to take the time or the effort to do to that, or, you know, they're not interested in in doing the work and they're, and they have time to wait and they want to wait, you know, for something else to come back. So we're doing the best we can to try to be as um, both sensitive to and um, 
provide options around the individual needs of each person who's building because everybody's building for different reasons we're all building the same airplanes but you know the uh, the highly individualized nature of building is, you know, different people work at different speeds and, you know, some people have set aside chunks of their life uh, to work on it full time, whereas, you know, other people are maybe, you know, we have, and, you know, we have customers um, in, a, in every group, you have a lot of people in the middle and a few people on each end, right? And there's a couple of customers that have been a, a little upset and, you know, maybe a little nasty if we're being honest in the real world, right? But, but only very very small you know and, I, and we understand the frustration that goes along with that but we, on the other end we also have customers that have said you know what i i have put my order in but i don't really need it until the fall of 2022 so if you want to move me way down on the list so that somebody else can benefit from it then they're willing to do that you know and that's really cool so you know i mean the community as a whole is just as it's always been you know we we're people supporting people that everybody kind of geeks out on these airplanes you know we're all airplane nerds right you know, like to build and helping each other out to, to make it all happen and put it together. And, you know, and for that, we really appreciate everyone. Yeah, and I think it's a it's a it's uh, an interesting point that, you know, as a community, a lot of people have rallied around this. And, you know, the, the history of home building has plenty of companies that wouldn't admit to a problem like this. Right. So, you know, you guys in your, your position in the industry, uh, it's it's super important that you go, hey, we have this problem. We got to level with you guys. This is what we're doing to fix it. And, you know, obviously and obviously taking steps to make sure it doesn't doesn't happen again. You know, I, I came to work here just about three years ago. And uh, I remember that the first day that I was here late into the night, I sat in the office over here with Ryan and got the brain dump. But one of the things that really, truly stood out you know, when Ryan was speaking with me, because Ryan's been here since. I think since God made dirt, something like that. And, <laughs> but uh, I'm not that old. <laughs> Twenty plus yeah. years. Ago, <laughs> yes. Right? So, yeah, and yeah. Um, but one of the things that that he said that I really appreciated was, um, you know, Advanced Aircraft, we do the right thing. Uh, you know, we're we're always going to do the right thing, and sometimes that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. And let's face it, um, this situation is an expensive situation for Advanced Aircraft. There's no doubt about it. Um, but it's the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, we, safety is very important to us. Quality is important. Uh, honesty and integrity. Um, we are here to build an uncommonly cool and great airplane and a product for the common man so that they can do some pretty neat stuff that most people don't get a chance to do. So, uh, thanks for your time, gentlemen. I appreciate it. We'll, uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll be on the phone here in like next 10 minutes to talk about the RV 15 and the 16 and the 17. <laughs> Very good. Well, but I do appreciate your time, guys. Yeah, Thank you for the opportunity. If anybody's coming to Sun and Fun, you know, we'll have a crew at Sun and Fun uh, in April. So drop by the booth and say hi. Uh, get a lanyard, which you can't get anywhere else. So Ooh. stop by there and grab it. Anyway, we look forward to seeing people. And um, thanks, everybody, for working with us and for your patience and understanding in this whole, whole situation. It's been awesome. Thanks, guys, and have a good Sun and Fun.